You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Dr. Seuss said it best. Welcome to the Listen for Life podcast with Genevieve Richardson. Genevieve is a speech-language pathologist rehabilitating adults with communication challenges after a stroke or due to a neurological impairment. Living with aphasia is hard. Caregiving is hard. You are not alone. Get equipped with knowledge from experts in the field and professionals you need to know. We'll hear stories and experiences from others who are navigating life with aphasia. So. Put your earphones in and take a walk outside. This isn't just a podcast. This is a community, a resource, and a support system. We're in this together. Do life. It's that time of year again. New Year's Eve is just around the corner, and with it comes the chance to start fresh with New Year's resolutions. But resolutions can be tough. It's too easy to set big lofty goals that are impossible to stick to. I've been listening to the audio book Atomic Habits by James Clear. In his book, James explains that you don't need to make major changes in your life all at once to have a big impact. Rather, make tiny changes to your behavior, which, when repeated over and over, will become habits that may lead to big results. If you improve just 1% every day for the year, then at the end of the year, you will be 37% better. Small changes make a big difference over time. Tiny habits are anchored on small changes that lead to great results down the road. There are three layers of behavior change he continues to talk about in the book. The first one is to change your outcome. What is it you want to achieve? The second is to change your process. The process is the way that you do it. Or three, change your identity, as in do change what you believe in. Your current behaviors are simply a reflection of your current identity. The way you behave is a mirror image of the type of person you believe that you are, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. If you want to change your behavior, you need to first change your identity, that is, change the things that you believe about yourself. The most effective way to change your habits is to focus on who you wish to become, not on what you want to achieve. Make the habit a part of your new identity. So let's shift this general talk about New Year's resolutions and doing changes. Let's shift now to talking about New Year's resolutions. Perhaps you've been thinking about what you want to change, or perhaps you are that person who has vowed never to make a resolution just because they never work out and you're always disappointed. So how can we set a resolution that is both realistic and achievable? Here are some tips to make it possible this year. Number one, start small. Resolutions are more likely to be successful if they're small and manageable. So instead of vowing to lose 50 pounds, try making a more realistic goal like losing five pounds and then repeat. Number two, set specific goals. Vague resolutions are more likely to fail. Instead of resolving to eat healthier, which is very nonspecific, get to a specific goal like eating two servings of fruits and vegetables at every meal. Number three, make a plan. Part of setting realistic and achievable resolutions is having a plan for how you are going to achieve them. So if your goal is to eat healthier, your plan might be to pack your own meals with fruits and vegetables for lunch and to cook more meals at home for dinner. Number four, be realistic. Don't set yourself up for failure by setting unrealistic goals. If you're not used to working out, don't set your resolution to work out seven days a week. Start slow and work your way up. 
Be patient. Change takes time. So don't get discouraged if you don't see results right away. Stick with it. Know that you are putting your best foot forward and working towards it every day. And eventually you will see the results. Get support. If you're struggling to stick to your resolutions, reach out for support from family or friends. They can help you stay on track and be accountable. So let's wrap this part up about resolutions because we have more things to talk about today. Remember, anyone can set resolutions, but it takes planning and effort to make them stick. By following these tips, you can set resolutions that are both realistic and achievable. So this is an aphasia podcast. So of course we have to bring New Year's resolutions back to communication and aphasia and improving our relationships and connection with our persons that we care about. So let's talk real quick about what's your biggest frustration regarding your loved one's communication. So many of the families I work with or support complain about the difficulty in getting clear answers from their person with aphasia. The theme of this frustration is that the person with aphasia doesn't respond in the way that the spouse expects them to respond. Oftentimes, the breakdown occurs because either the person with aphasia doesn't completely understand the question and just provides the first response available to them, or the question asked was not specific enough. Of course, these are generalities and your situation may be different. But let's keep going on this theme of asking questions. So there are different forms of questions that are more aphasia friendly. The first of these four are yes, no questions. Do you want water? Do you want steak? Choice questions. What would you like to eat? So right there, I set the context, then ask the question. Do you want chicken or steak? WH questions is a speechy term that we use for questions that start with who, what, where, when, why, how come, how many. Yes, there's some H questions in there, but you get the gist. WH questions can help set context. And then finally, the fourth type of aphasia-friendly question are closed-ended questions. Instead of asking, what would you like to do today, which is an open-ended question, ask, would you like to go somewhere today? And that way you're getting a yes, no response from your person. And then you can follow up with other questions. Many persons with aphasia don't understand they aren't providing you with useful cues. People with aphasia are doing the best they can. They may not be able to establish a context, a sequence of information, or give you the most relevant details to help you understand their message. This is where the type of questions you ask comes in and why it's so important. So let's talk about Jim. Jim is a gentleman that is sitting in his living room and he's looking out the big window. Looking outside, he can see the street, there's some trees, there's a neighbor house in the distance. Jim gets all excited and he calls his wife into the room and she comes over to look out the window. Now is when the 20 questions starts. Jim is excited about something. He clearly has something he wants to communicate. But as his wife is looking out the window, she doesn't see anything out there that can lead to what this excitement he's showing. So Jim's ability to respond to yes, no questions in a quiet environment, he's nine out of 10 normally. And he can respond either with a head nod or shake or thumbs up, thumbs down. Or sometimes he's so good, just his facial expression can give you a yes, no response. 
However, in this particular situation, when he was so excited and he's pointing and he's trying to get his message across and his frustration is building because his wife isn't getting it right away, his accuracy turns out to be more like one out of 10 or two out of 10 in answering a question accurately. So what is this spouse supposed to do? He clearly has something he needs to communicate. First step would be, you've got to bring the emotional part down. Once the emotions take over, whether it's a positive or negative emotion, the thinking skills of the person with aphasia, it gets a little more jumbled. It's a little harder to sort out the words they want, the thoughts, the concepts. So emotions, even positive emotions can challenge the person with aphasia's it can challenge their ability to understand what they hear. Second, you need to really establish context first. Use one of these four types of aphasia-friendly questions that I mentioned a moment ago to establish the subject or the context. Jim clearly had something he wanted to say. Third, utilize all means of communication, whether that is writing a word, using a communication book, using gestures. Fourth, consider that what Jim is trying to say may not be related to that exact moment in time that he just got so excited and he called you into the room as he's pointing out the living room window. He could possibly just now be coming up with a way to tell you something that was from a previous conversation. For some people with aphasia, it's more important for them to get their message out regardless of the time that has passed. In this instance, in our example of Jim, he found a way by pointing out the living room window that just on the other side of a big tree, just peeking out in the corner was a sign for a store. Earlier that day, the wife had asked him, what he wanted to have for dinner. And at that time, he couldn't indicate to her what it was he wanted. So literally what was happening in this moment, Jim saw the corner of that sign peeking through the tree and that's what he was pointing out. But his wife didn't see the sign. It wasn't front and center. It wasn't in the context of the front yard. It ended up Jim wanted chicken from Arco and that sign was for Arco. So how she eventually figured out what he wanted, she had the realization that he was indicating something from a time that was not in the moment. He had been working it out in his mind how to communicate to her what he wanted. And then when he saw that sign, it was like an epiphany, an aha moment. But her reaction at that time, she's standing at the window looking outside trying to figure out what is it he's telling me. There was just confusion and frustration. And because he was all worked up, he was having a hard time hearing her questions completely. So what she was able to do is both of them were able to relax, taking a couple of breaths. She let him know that it was important to get his message and that she was there and she was engaged and she was going to try. So she was able to ask some direct yes and no questions, first of all, to establish context. And in this situation, the context was from earlier in the day. So once she figured that out, she was able to kind of open her mind and not look exactly what's in the foreground, looking out that living room window, but she saw what was in the background. And that's when she saw the sign. And that's when they were able to work together and figure out exactly what it is he wanted. So the two best questions to ask, especially if somebody's excited, they're worked up, ask yes, no questions, figure out your context first. Once you know where you're going, 
then it's much easier to give choice questions, to ask a WH question, or to ask closed-ended questions. As always, if frustration is building, breathe, take a minute, reassure your person with aphasia that you are there to help figure out what it is they want to say to you. And then try again. You might even have to pause, but definitely don't forget to come back to the situation and try and figure it out. Boil communication down to the least common denominator. Keep it simple. Keep it consistent. So I propose that you consider how you ask questions of your loved one with aphasia to be your New Year's resolution. Asking questions in an effective way can help so much with communication and connection. So to that end, I've created a new freebie for you. It's a PDF workbook and it's called A New Year, A New Way of Asking Questions. This downloadable PDF is available to you now in the show notes and also through the website Do Life speechpathology.com. Use this workbook. There's a lot of good information in there. Just 1% change in a day can add up exponentially. Be mindful of how you're asking questions. If you have a particularly challenging communication situation, think about it later. Really Process it, analyze it, see what could have been done differently. Maybe you'll have a new insight just like this spouse did for Jim, who was trying to tell her what he wanted for dinner. And he finally figured out a way to be specific by pointing to that sign outside of his living room window. I'd love to hear how this workbook helps you ask better questions. There's a great page of more communication tips and tricks and strategies in there for you. If you'd like specific help improving communication with your loved one, Life Speech Pathology can help. Free consultations are available by phone or by Zoom, and you can find a link for scheduling that consult both in the show notes and on the website. I am wishing each of you a very, very, very happy and wonderful new year. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen for Life podcast. We hope you feel empowered and supported. Head over to listenforlifepodcast.com to see the show notes with links and information from today's episode. Do you have a topic, a resource to share, or a guest recommendation? Inquiring minds want to know. Let us know in the comments section. Wishing you a fabulous week.